the wealthy New Englanders seem to escape the heat and humidity of the summer months. Thank you. Between July and September each year, these sparsely populated coastal towns swell to capacity with handsome, well-heeled vacationers. But there's another side to Maine, one where people graft hard for a living, on land and sea, a rural, rugged existence, which fed the penetrating gaze of artist Andrew Wyeth and fueled his long and extraordinary career. Wyeth not only immortalized the American landscape, he created interior worlds, hidden histories, intrigue, and magic. His unflinching vision didn't always please the art world, but it captured the hearts and minds of the American people. My exploration of Wyeth's long life and prolific work begins here, at this remote farmstead. It was this rural side of Maine that in 1948 inspired Andrew Wyeth to paint his masterpiece, a work that became an icon of American art and a painting which has puzzled and intrigued me from the first time I saw it. Wyeth's most famous painting was named after its subject, a woman he once described as a wounded gull. The painting was called Christina's World. The backdrop to Wyeth's painting of Christina's World is this 18th century farmhouse. Now preserved as a state museum, the farm once owned by the Olson family has become a destination for modern pilgrims who want to experience the almost spiritual significance of this location. Janice Casper, once a tour guide here, shows me around. So here's the house, and it's been here for quite a while, and you can see it's uh, weathered. weathered. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> when Andrew Wyeth first started to paint here during his family summer holidays in the 1940s, the farm was owned and run by Alvaro Olson and his unmarried sister, Christina. They lived without electricity into the 1950s. They collected rainwater off the roof, was their water supply, and they lived off the land. Yeah. So I, I want to show you something in this hallway. Yeah. And if we scoot down, yeah. this is Christina's refrigerator. So that when I slide it open, oh, yes. and if you, you can feel how cold it is. And you can Absolutely. see the shells. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. And it's also a way to get down to check the sister. Simple technology. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Alvaro and Christina's hand to mouth existence on the farm was not the only challenge they faced. When Christina was a little girl, her mother noticed that she fell a lot. And then as she got older, it got progressively worse. She got, her legs got weaker. And then by the time I think that um, she was in her 40s, she pretty much lost the use of her legs. And she was one of these tough, proud, stubborn women who uh, refused to use cane or crutches or a wheelchair. She was going to get uh, around on her own ability. And in this house, I understand she would hitch herself around in a chair or she would crawl. And outside she crawled. Christina's disability meant that the upstairs floors of the house were out of her reach. They were closed up and used for storage until Andrew Wyeth began to use the rooms as makeshift studios. There's one painting he made from up here, which for me really captures the essence of the place. When Wyeth prized up this window, it hadn't been opened for years. Such was his attention to detail that he waited for two months for the wind to change in the right direction before completing the painting. It was also from up here that he first saw Christina dragging herself through the grass, like, as he put it, a crab on a New England shore. This painting really is much less simple than you think at first sight. I mean, I remember when I first saw it, I thought that the figure in the foreground was a young girl, and we know that um, Christina here was in her mid-50s and she was a paraplegic and that's the way she moved through the grass. You know, when you understand it's not a purely realistic picture, he's trying to express something through this picture. You have to try and work out what it is he's expressing. And what I can see here is Christina looking up at the farm, which she can never get away from. And there's something there, sort of almost 
She's almost trapped. It's almost like she won't get away. Despite this vast open space, despite all the potential of it, there's something quite dark going on there. So is she trying to get away or is she trying to get back? <laughs> I don't know. It's just, it's a puzzle. It raises so many questions. Although Christina was an important muse for Wyeth, he also painted scenes in and around the Olsen farm for more than 30 summers, producing over 300 distinctive works. When Christina Olsen died in 1968, it closed an important chapter in Wyeth's career. But by far the largest portion of his work was created in a very different landscape, 500 miles south of here. Chad's Ford, Pennsylvania, Wyeth's permanent home from his birth in 1917 to his death in 2009, is a small town with a big place in American history. These meadows by the Brandywine River were once battlefields. Almost 223 years ago to the day, British and American soldiers fought each other here in the War of Independence or the Great Revolutionary War, as the Brandywine reenactors prefer to call it. Have you ever had the pleasure of firing one of these? No, no, no. Oh, no. my Is friend. It a great pleasure? I, I can think see so. see you like it. There's some <laughs> sparkle in your eye, which makes me think that there's uh, an element uh, uh, of... Uh, well, some danger there. But... Do you have a pair of glasses, just yeah. for safety's sake? Just there to be careful. There might be some stuff flying well, about. Well, you get, you get powder that flashes up okay. when the powder oh. is ignited. It's meant to go that way. <laughs> well, you know, it will. It will. OK. okay. Will this kick fire? I mean, uh, it shouldn't happen? be that much of a kick, because there isn't a bullet in it. OK. <laughs> More, please. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, sorry. Yeah, sorry, oh, British. You got him running. You got him running. <laughs> How important was the battle that was fought here in the Brandywine River? Oh, the battle was, I mean, very important. You have, this is, one, the largest land battle of the Revolution. And you have the British over on this side over here, yeah. uh, and the Americans on this side. Now, the landscape is not going to be very reflective of what it was in the 18th mm. century. You had a lot more concealment, yeah. a lot more cover. Yeah. Uh, and in the morning hours, it was just basic scattered musket shot going across the yeah. river back and forth yeah. between the two armies. But in the afternoon, that's when the British started crossing, mm. and the fierce fighting really took place. Locals say the river behind me ran red with the blood of dying and injured bodies of British and American officers. But despite the setback at the Brandywine River, the Americans went on to win their war against the British oppressors and claim this vast country as their own. A country that Wyeth's father raised his son to always feel proud to belong to. Andrew Wyeth was born into a wealthy artistic family of Swiss-German origin. Known as Andy, he was the youngest of five children, doted on by his three older sisters, particularly Anne, his constant childhood companion. So what was it like, you know, for your mother and Andrew, who were sort of two years apart, growing up in this house? What was their relationship? How did they...? Yeah. Well, they were wonderful friends. Of course, they slept in the same bed. Hmm. They played together. Uh, and, and as children, they did everything together mm. in the beginning. I mean, at, at some point, he, I mean, they drew. There were always papers. But they played up in these woods. They dressed up. They played Robin Hood. They played knights. They did all the things that Grandpa was painting. The young Andrew's love of storybook war and heroism was fed not only by the battle-scarred history around him, but also by his great influence and teacher, his larger-than-life father, Newell Converse Wyeth. Known as N.C., or Pa, to his family, he was a celebrated artist, sought after for his dynamic picture book illustrations, which brought history to life. His work for Scribner's Classics had generations of readers spellbound. N.C. was so successful as a commercial artist, he was able to build a grand family home, construct a studio behind it, and pay for the surrounding 18 acres of land with a commission for one single work. Treasure Island. You know, he was so real to all of us. It was always what Pa said, what Pa did, what he thought, what... I mean, he created this world for us all. He dressed up as old Chris. Old Santa Claus. And he actually got up on the roof 
and he stamped around and he rang bells down that chimney and woke them up and they came down to see him just out of the corner of their eye leaving. There's something about this family that, that I think is remarkable. There's a quality of joy in life, of joy in everything. And Grandpa had that. And my mother had that. And she kept on with that. And Andy had that. It's just open to the box. It's the ribbon. It's just joy at life of, of, of just God. Isn't it great? Andy's childhood was exciting and idyllic but also dogged by ill health, recurring chest infections, and a problem with his hip, which affected him throughout his life. But neither of them seemed to temper his inquisitive nature and boisterous creative energy. And so he was kind of an enfant terrible, in a way, you know? I mean, he was, he was allowed, you know, he was precocious and he was not denied anything. N.C. decided his youngest son was too fragile for public school, so Andy was tutored at home. He was free to roam around his father's studio, where epic scenes of American heroism were being conjured up with the help of period costumes and historical regalia. N.C. Wyeth was an enormously successful commercial artist, and yet all this didn't really matter to him. He was determined to shape his gifted young son into the kind of fine art painter that he himself would never really become. He wanted his son to be free, both artistically and personally. Andrew found heroism not in a costumed and constructed world like his father's, but in the reality of everyday life. His first show at the Macbeth Gallery in New York in 1937 was a sellout. So impressed was his father that he proclaimed that his son Andrew was on the right track to reach the pinnacle of American art. So, no pressure there. This is uh, an early self-portrait of Andrew, painted just after he had a big success in New York with an exhibition. He was 21 years old. Um, I think it's quite interesting because uh, he's sort of projecting himself as a serious, successful artist, but at the same time there's something in the eyes, a kind of a wariness of, you know, don't read me too easily, there's something of a mystery there. Um, and this was one of the first paintings that he painted in egg tempera. He'd rejected um, the oil paints that his father, N.C. Wyeth, had brought him up to use. And I can only think that that must have been deliberate, that to try and escape from the shadow of his uh, celebrated father, um, he chose different subjects, but also different materials to paint those subjects. The Brandywine River Museum houses the largest collection of both N.C. and Andrew Wyeth's work. Joyce Stoner and her team are tasked with conserving the painting of both father and son. The self-portrait that he did, was that the first time he used egg tempera? Oh, yes. He hits the ground running with the self-portrait and then the portrait of Walt Anderson. And it's, they're done so similarly, and they were sort of brothers under the skin at that time. Andrew was fascinated with outsiders and especially trickster pranksters. He had to feel a special kinship. And Walt Anderson, who is pictured in Young Swede, is a wonderful example of this. Walt is a trickster. He is a lobster poacher. Apparently, he and Andy would steal boats together. And so they were, pi he loved anyone who was a pirate. Mm. And so Walt was an original pirate. And you, you see how he paints Walt as this incredibly handsome young man that they did things together and had fun. And he loved it, that he was a pirate and he was always breaking the rules. Andrew Wyeth also bucked the trend when it came to his painting technique. He chose to work in egg tempera, a challenging medium barely used since the 16th century. And so it started with someone picking up an egg and you're going to do, what are you going to do? Well, I think you're going to do it. <laughs> How'd so you like it? Scramble <laughs> yeah, well, yeah. well, what we're going to do is we're going to separate the egg yolk from the white. So yeah. go ahead and break the egg. Okay. There we go. Let the white fall into the jar. Yep, yeah, there we are. And okay. there's the yolk and now what? Pass it from hand okay. to hand. Yeah. And you can wipe your hands on that. I've honestly never done this before. No. Ever, ever. 
Oh, I'm quite good at this, actually. Whoa, no. Okay. Oh, dear. Well, there we are. You see. Well, that's why we there drop we more than one. That's it. I was getting overconfident. <laughs> Wyatt's decision to use egg tempera was bold. Not only did he need to mix paint from egg yolk and pigments every time he started, but its quick drying properties meant he had to work fast. And mix that up, we now have paint. Okay. Why did they do that? Why did they discover that egg and pigment went together particularly well? It, it's actually a very good binder to hold pigments to a surface, so mm. painting. Um, we know that between the Middle Ages up until around 1500, it was the dominant paint medium in Europe. Right. So when we think about it, especially with early Italian paintings of the early masters, Giotto through Masaccio. Was it to, uh, discovered in the Renaissance? Or, or, or it actually before? predates the Renaissance. Yeah, so if yeah. we think of late medieval paintings, uh, the earlier mm. icons are all painted in egg tempera. Mm. He loved taking tempera where it shouldn't go. And when people told him you couldn't paint tempera at night, uh, that it wasn't a night medium, he painted Walt Anderson again poaching lobsters, and it's called night hauling. And he pushed tempera to look like night. If you also look up close at the temperas, and look at trodden weed up close, it looks like a micro Jackson Pollock. It looks like a little explosion, because he is doing things you're not supposed to do with tempera. So these are the Andrew yeah. Wyeth galleries, and they're changed periodically with wonderful things. The young yeah. Swede and this fabulous thing of his yeah. dog, it looks like a railroad. And then, oh, here are all the different ones he painted in Chad's yeah. Ford. Joyce, there's this perception that when you look at Wyeth's work, you're looking at the work of a realist, albeit maybe a romantic realist. And then you see a painting like this, and that's almost abstract in the shapes and all that. How did he see what he was doing, and how did others see what he was doing? Oh, well, absolutely. He was very aware of powerful shapes and forms. Yeah. If you look at the roof and the powerful beams coming out at you, it's a very, and, and the shadows, yeah. it's, it's very powerful and it very is, spooky, really. It juts out against the grey sky. But next to it, there's this sketch. Did he do preliminary sketches? He often did preliminary yeah. sketches while he was working on conceptualizing what this sort of magic realism, this spooky, this chilly sense of death. And so this is a wonderful comparison yeah. of the whoosh yes. with the precise yeah. and showing them right together. So this was a, is this a watercolor? Or, or yes, it's, yeah, a, it, yeah. it's ink and watercolor. And you can just and see it slightly more. The, the grays are slightly lighter and the shadings on the birds are slightly lighter. Here's a much bolder, blacker sort of Exactly, shape. exactly. Here we see another version of the two worlds of Andrew Wyeth. The free splash mm. and dash of the watercolor and then the exactitude, but they do work together as you can see him working out in his mind how to do this. Well, what's part of the reason that he chose to paint in tempera to distinguish himself from his father and his father's preference for oils? Absolutely. Andrew had to rebel from NC, and so you can really look at how the media bounce around as yeah. they try to get out of each other's way. Yeah. And because there's tremendous love and tremendous competition in that family. Yes. It was not just Andrew Wyeth's unique painting style which helped him break away from his father's often overbearing influence. It was also the love of a determined young woman whom he met in the summer of 1939. Betsy James was brought up in New England, the daughter of a Welsh picture editor and a well-bred Christian mother. With her striking looks, she was a force to be reckoned with. Despite NC's objections, Andrew, not one to pussyfoot around, proposed to Betsy within weeks of meeting her. She accepted. Betsy was 18 and Andrew was 21. The marriage produced two boys, Nicky, and Jamie, and lasted 69 years until Wyeth's death. Oh, I was very fortunate to run into her. I didn't know I had that many brains so young. We're different. It's all, not always peaceful, but nothing good is peaceful. Remember that. If you've got too much peace, God help you. You have to have a kick in the tail once in a while. But we have a great time. We don't have a dull moment, I can tell you that. Wanting to keep his young son close, N.C. gifted the newlyweds a property near to the Wyeth family home. The old schoolhouse became not only a home for his young family, but also Andrew's first studio of his own. Away from his father, Betsy's influence over him increased, as their son Jamie remembers. It was a painting, a tempera, which was a medium that he was just really starting with, and it was just a figure walking away in a field. And he was very excited about it and asked his father to come see it. And his father said, Andy, you know, it's remarkable, but 
you need to put a gun in his hand <laughs> and you have to have dogs. Yeah. But completely missing what yeah. his son was doing. Yeah. And Betsy, who was probably 18, said, don't listen to that old fart. You do exactly what you're doing. Yeah. Yeah. Pretty amazing. So I mean, yeah. with no knowledge of painting, she got it. Mm. And she obviously adored his work mm. and yeah. thought, this is incredible yeah. Yeah. what's being produced here. This is a world that's extraordinary. Yeah. My father was very close to his father, mm -hmm. and his father was very close to him. I mean, he just wanted to control him. Yeah. Young Betsy James was his escape away from that. Yeah, but in a way, he married his father. I mean, yeah. she became yes. totally yeah. the one then controlling, yes. but, but gave him freedom to do exactly what he wanted, but kept track of yeah. what was being painted, what was, and, you know, titles. He titled everything. Did she? So, everything. so, really? So, Christina's world? And he was totally her yeah. title. Really? He just painted, and then... Showed it to her. Betsy took every opportunity to promote her husband's work. Before long, the marriage evolved into a business partnership, where the boundaries between family and work began to blur. Well, I mean, it wasn't that my father was going to work putting a tie on or whatnot. No. It was just he would wander in from the breakfast table, and, day, and we would wander in as children lying on the floor here doing drawing. But it was just, this was our house. Yeah. And when you see some of these drawings here, do they bring back memories? Do you know what they're all well, about? Yes, when he was working, he would have drawings tacked all over the wall, all over the floor. As you see, there are footprints, dog prints, stepping on them. I mean, he was to be completely immersed in what he was doing, totally forgetting time. And in fact, he was a wild painter. I mean, water was thrown, paint was all over the floor. He liked the accidents. Really? Really? Yeah, that's interesting. And then it all gets filtered and down to a rather finally controlled final product. starts to be distilled. Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah. He's a very peculiar painter, Andrew Wyeth. I mean, it's this funny, airless, crystalline world, particularly in the tempers. And it was a very strange, peculiar world, which I think makes his work extraordinary. Yeah. You know? Although Wyeth had an official studio indoors, his unofficial outdoor studio was the whole of Chad's Ford. Andrew Wyeth painted uninterrupted for almost seven full decades, one of the longest careers of any artist. What he painted here at Chad's Ford was confined to just a few square miles. This small piece of territory and the people who occupied it revealed to Wyeth a world so deep and detailed that no matter how often he painted it, he always discovered something new. But there was one location within Chad's Ford which would become more important to him than any other. At the Kerner farm, Wyeth would produce hundreds of sketches and paintings over a period of 70 years. As with Christina and the Olsen farm, the inspiration that Wyeth drew from this one location was boundless. He started painting it when he was 15 and stopped the year before he died. He was fascinated not just by the farm and the landscape around it, but also by the Kerner family who lived here, enigmatic outsiders, German immigrants. He was fascinated by their connection with the Teutonic old world of his ancestors. Wyeth was attracted to the rhythms of life here, as well as to its owners, farmer Karl Kerner, his wife Anna, and their children. Their son Karl Jr. remembers seeing Wyeth painting in and around the farm. Everybody liked Andrew Wyeth. He uh, would come early mornings. We never knew he'd be up in the woods painting or all, or we'd be cutting along the field. We'd see Andy and say hello. I said, Andy, I said, stay away from the hayfield. We said, we come with our big cutter. We cut your toes off. <laughs> Carl Jr.'s father intrigued Wyeth, not just because of his German ancestry, but also his experience in battle as a machine gunner in the First World War. My father, he talked a lot about the First World War. It gave Andy a lot of ideas and being in the trenches, you know, that uh, fierce fighting. A lot of my father lost a lot of his close friends. And uh, he said, when you're in trenches, you've got to keep your head down. To me, it made him very stern. It's like working for a German officer. You take the good with the bad. Carl's mother, Anna, was a continual source of fascination for Wyeth, who portrayed her as a lost soul, an almost spectral figure. My mother was very 
quiet, congenial. I think she was homesick. She wanted to take us children and all back to Germany. My father said, no, you can't do that now. He said, we're here, we have to make the best of it. I understand that there was a Wyeth family tragedy here, and you were working on the farm close to where it happened. We were up there husking corn, we heard this crash. I thought an airplane come down or something. A big noise. A big noise. And I said, all the fellows wait here, I'll walk down, see what happened. Andrew Wyeth's father, N.C., was driving his car with his four-year-old grandson in the back when tragedy struck on a railroad at the foot of Kerner's farm. N.C. Wyeth and his young grandson were killed outright when the car in which they were travelling was hit by a train on this railway line in October 1945. But no one knows the cause of the accident. Was it mechanical failure in the car? Was it a temporary heart attack? Was it, as some people say, that N.C. was sketching at the time? The only thing we really know is that we should never know. We're coming to the location of my father's where he was killed. And that brought it to a head to me because it, all this life that I'd had by myself over here, I didn't really tell Amon about it. Uh, it all became, the fact that he was killed here, it all became very pointed to me in its meaning. It wasn't just because it was a handsome looking hill or a lovely old barn. That, that wasn't it at all. It was just, again, became sort of a memory of everything to me that meant something to me. So it all made this whole place very poignant to me. Not just a farm, but a certain truth. It gave me a reason to paint. Up to that point, I was painting, but I think I was painting pictures. Then there became a real reason, an urge to do something. Emotional reason. I think it made me. NC's accident was not the only tragedy Wyeth would associate with Kerner's farm. When Carl Kerner was diagnosed with cancer in the early 1970s, Wyeth charted his slow decline from warrior to wasted body, the shadow of his own father's death always present. Something else had been happening at Kerner's farm during the years Wyeth was charting Carl's fading health. It all started when Andrew met the woman brought in to care for the sick farmer. On hot summer afternoons, she took to resting in the upstairs attic, which Wyeth had begun to use as one of his temporary studios. She was Prussian, like the Kerners, a German immigrant. She was married with children in her mid-thirties. Her name was Helga Testorf. Andrew started to paint her, sleeping, waking, thinking, dressed and undressed. But for 15 years, he hid away every painting he produced, not just from the outside world, but also from his wife and business partner, Betsy. Helga became the catalyst for one of the greatest scandals in American art history and one of its best kept secrets. He continued to paint his usual subjects and by producing a steady flow of work, Wyeth was able to paint Helga without arousing suspicion. But the concealment couldn't last. When the Helga paintings were first revealed, how did it happen? What was told to the public? They were revealed as uh, the secret body of work, kept private even from his own family and especially his wife. And therefore, uh, he must be hiding something beyond just the fact that he painted this, the, these nudes. That was sort of the subtext of almost everything that was written at the time, that uh, he had betrayed his wife Betsy in some way. Betsy Wyeth had been the driving force behind an extremely successful business, producing reproductions of her husband's work for sale to the general public. But it was not popular with everyone. Most of the critics took pot shots based on reproductions they had seen or works that were in public collections, which weren't that many. I mean, aside from Christina's World at the Museum of Modern Art, there weren't that many hanging in museums around the country for a variety of reasons. Yeah. And I think for New York critics in particular, they were just dumbfounded by an artist who would paint farms and, yeah. and fishermen. I think that aspect of his work is part and parcel of what critics see as the sort of nostalgia of looking back at earlier periods of time. 
frankly, Edward Hopper did the same thing. He wasn't a real fan of cities. He was uh, mm. kind of lamenting the loss of farms and rural life. And um, there is that heritage that is very uh, deep-seated and embedded in sort of the American psyche, I think, in some ways. However controversial Wyeth's output was amongst the critics, it didn't stop the 250 works that make up the Helga cycle being sold almost immediately. They went to a single collector for what was reportedly around $6 million. The national scandal had only helped push up the price. You know, Andy had his own reasons for what he did, and I think part of it was uh, in the nature of a surprise for, uh, for the world, but also for his wife. He wanted to uh, prove in his own way that uh, he was capable of this rather, in those days, and in his mind, a body of work that was going to raise some eyebrows. He wanted to go deeper. He wanted to build on that early success, but he was trying to get at certain aspects of the human condition that were and are you know, important to him. You know, change, life, death, sex, all of those things are kind of the themes that he, he explored throughout his work in various ways. In almost three decades since the scandal broke, Helga Testorf has rarely spoken about her experiences. Today, she's agreed to meet me and talk about her years with Wyeth. Hello, Helga. Hello there, sir. Michael. How are you, Michael? Michael Penn, very nice to meet you. Thank you so much for talking welcome. to us. It's, it's great to meet you. Thank you. Can I ask you to just take you slightly back to the circumstances which led to him revealing the 15 years' worth of paintings he did of you? Uh, how did that come about? Did he tell you that he... It was I don't the have time to tell came? you that. That is so obvious. It was expected of him to put out paintings like pancakes. And no real artist wants to be in control of producing paintings that look like postcards, one after another. So are you saying that he was going through a period when he was producing things that were sort of what, well, commer commercially bias, dictated? You know? yeah, okay. Sure, just like that. He needed to be painting for himself. And he knew that the paintings he had done with you. He didn't have to show them to anybody. He could learn, he could he needed to feed himself. Not always have some critic tell him, Oh, this is good, this is not good. When he was the most peaceful man, why would he argue with them? They didn't know any better. Mm -hmm. He was the best critic there was. And together we critiqued, believe me. I learned a lot. And he listened to me too. It was so important what you did for him. Was that something, a relationship that, that worked straight away? Maybe, yeah, or was I, it something that developed? I always wanted to be a model or an artist or a movie star. Mm -hmm. It was a childish dream because my mother always said, you got to have a profession first. Mm -hmm. So the fact that he wanted you to model for him, that must have been for you a wonderful sort of release in a way. Yes, it was. Yes, it was. I couldn't believe it. But you know, when I do something, it's not just 100 percent, it's all or nothing. Roughly how many hours a day would you be? Oh my working? God, in the beginning we did eight hours sometimes. Eight hours? It was long. He always said, are you tired yet? I said, no, keep on going. I guess we both knew whatever it takes. There's such a stillness in a lot of the paintings. Was that hard, hard. to get? So it's not just a question of lying on a bed and going to sleep. Yeah, it was hard. Uh, you're sore. Because you have to hold a certain mm -hmm. position. Very sore. When the, the paintings he made of you were revealed and the press got hold of it, I mean... It wasn't was supposed this, to. Was this something you were prepared for? No, of course not. Never. It wasn't supposed to be shown until it's after his death. He totally... <laughs> really? He totally... I think he was uh, sort of caught in something too to let it come out. When, I don't know how it came out. But are you saying that he, he didn't want the paintings to be seen until mm -hmm. after his death? Mm -hmm. Is that what you're saying? That was his promise to me. But Mother Nature had other plans. When the story of the Helga paintings broke in 1985, the American press bombarded Helga's family home, hounding her to speak out about a supposed affair with Andrew Wyeth. All hell broke loose, I think. All the uh, paparazzis who were after us couldn't find me. Oh, I loved it. <laughs> well, how, how did you get away? How did oh, you get away from you. them? That's me. Secret? That's me, absolutely. There must have been people wagging tongues saying that you were his mistress and, uh, you know, it was a sexual relationship. They didn't know any better. 
They didn't know our language. We were not talking that way. We had better things to think about. I said, you just missed the sunrise, or you just missed the, the light, and did you see the beautiful moon last night? Nature has all the answers. So they couldn't a, follow us. It wasn't a sexual relationship. But it has nothing to do with it. Whatever was personal, what's that got to do with the painting if you are sitting and trying to get a certain tone, for instance? Mm. You know how many times you have to try? And do you know there is magic in a brush? Mm. You think you wanted anybody to watch them paint? Mm. I put it right on the line, and that's about it. There were many people who knocked at our door and said, Oh, can I go out painting with you? Uh, can I watch you paint? Certainly not. Any more than I, I would have you watch me making love. No. Mm. The nude is the most holy thing that you can get next to. It's a divine spirit. The soul, he paints the soul. Wyeth's younger son, Jamie, now has his permanent home in Maine, on Southern Island, a short boat ride from Tennant's Harbour. Carrying on the family tradition, Jamie Wyeth, like his father Andrew and his grandfather N.C., is a respected painter in his own right. Whilst his painting has its own distinct style, his father's work ethic has certainly rubbed off on him. Fantastic. Jamie is clearly a man who works hard at his art. There we go. Good to see Welcome you Welcome to Southern Island. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, thank you. <laughs> wow, it's a long way up. Here. Thanks for sending the boat. So That's the studio, but I paint in the bathroom, I paint in the trees, so I, I, I like not having a real studio. <laughs> Just <laughs> what takes your fancy yes, that exactly. particular day. Yeah, absolutely. Island life became a sanctuary for the family after the furore of the Helga scandal. What was the reaction from the family when uh, the Helga paintings were revealed? Um, or well, what was the effect on the family? Well, I mean, it's a remarkable body of work. I think the first reaction was, my God, I mean, he produced this huge amount of work and also produced all other things at the time and all kept this sort of secret. And, uh, and was your mother's immediate reaction? Well, her first shot? reaction must have been was amazing that this body of work. And then she then, you know, it was obviously, a, she felt, how could he have done this without my knowledge? I mean, she had been a, a real partner of he and his life and work. And of course, the, the complete, you couldn't get more diametric opposites than Betsy Wyatt and Helga Tesdorf. A little picture of and both. So, well, it was really it was a perfect portrait of my father. I mean, he would go from his house with my mother, which, and that house is devoid of flowers, devoid of any artifice. In one. It's just the paintings on the wall, very sort of. And then he would travel to a studio, which was Helga's domain, which was complete chaos. Mm. Food stacked up, magazine, books, tunnels through. It, it really the two sides of, of my father's personality. Yeah. And I don't think he really even had a love affair with Helga. It wasn't any of that. It was just he was obsessed with her fingernails, her elbow, her pubic hair, whatever. He was just obsessed with sort of getting her on paper and paint. The relationship then between your mother and Helga, I imagine, was a sort of slightly awkward area? Or, or... Yes. But I think, you know, to me, the Helga thing, I mean, it was a combination of his interest in Carl Kerner, Germans at part of Chad's Ford, where they lived, the whole, it, it, a lot of things rolled into, into that sort of thing. And then the big secret, the fact that he was able to work on these things without people knowing about it. So why he ended up living on an island? Why, why was that? Well, because my mother, his wife, chose to live on an island. She wanted to create this world, mm. and, and he didn't want it. So an island person he was not. Yeah. Why did she like the island? She the loved the control. She loved the fact of being surrounded by water and she could control who was seeing, you know, what was going on and so forth. It, it fit right into her modus operandi. Okay. Cheers again. Michael, thank you, thank you, thank you. you. Thank you. Safe travel. Yeah. 
It seems pretty clear to me that Andy was a free spirit who could never be tied down. After the Helga scandal was over, he continued to see his muse, now no longer a secret. Helga was often by his side while he painted, both during his summers in Maine and when the summer was over, back in Chats 4. Although Andrew had painted his hometown for most of his life, he continued to find new subjects, even in his later years. In the 1990s, he transferred his attentions to local couple George and Helen Sipala. He virtually took up residence in their home, becoming almost part of the furniture. He wanted to get as up close and personal as was humanly possible, recording and painting every detail of their daily routine. He knew where the key was, he knew how to get in, and he came when he wanted to. So you didn't feel it was kind of like an intrusion? You kind of no, no, no. Huh? Now, when we, he caught us in bed, that was a little embarrassing. Well, he caught you in bed? Well, it's like he would come in maybe 6 o'clock, and once he knew where the key was, then he would sneak. He loved to sneak in on us. I mean, he loved to tiptoe <laughs> up the stairs. Yeah. And he would go down the hall, and the first few times, he'd stand by the bed, and for some reason, I would wake up, and I'd scream because he'd be <laughs> standing over me. And then we, after a while, we'd start catching on, and we listened for the car. Yeah. And then we started playing jokes on him. So he always expected us to be in the bed, yeah. which we stayed there. But sometimes we put the wigs mannequins on ourselves, in mannequins inside mm. on the yeah. pillow, like they were sleeping. And, then we'd, and we'd step into the next room and look through the cracks of the door and, and watch him coming in on his, you know, tiptoeing mm. ever so lightly. You know? Then he'd go and he'd pick up the um, bedspread. And, the, and from the back room, we'd be saying, gotcha, you gotcha, you know? We'd, we did terrible things to him, terrible things, but he loved it. It doesn't sound very restful, your mornings, you know? No. What are we going to do today? No. Uh, he met his match when he came here. Yeah, yeah. For all those years he painted, I would have to call my boss and say, I'll be a little late today. Andy had no concept of time, of my job. He would start painting, and if I had to leave, he would get very upset. He was very um, possessive That's of his, yeah. uh, he really yeah. was. It was a hideaway for him yeah. um, when he wanted to get away from Anybody. the news people, um, visitors, if company of any kind. This, this was a hideaway. Yeah. His wife? Oh, I think everybody wants to get away from the wife <laughs> once in a while. I'm not going to say anything. Everybody <laughs> wants to get away from the husband <laughs> once in a while, too. <laughs> Andy made a point of having Christmas with the Sipalas. In the last 20 years of his life, he spent virtually every Christmas day with them. I said, Andy, we're going to have you over for a Christmas party. And he said, well, I'm going to tell you now, Betsy won't come. So George wrote Betsy a letter and uh, said, in effect, um, in the nicest of words, that we will miss you and there was, it, it, you'll be very comfortable here and blah, 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 down the line, whole letter, and at the very end... I told her to get her ass over here. Yeah. <laughs> in those words. <laughs> and I understand that her secretary says, how can anybody talk to you like that? Yeah, she but she came. She came. She came. She came. Well, she came. Yeah. Yes, that got her. That yeah. got her. We went to the door and there she was. Hello, welcome. Hi. Welcome Hi. to Come the Sopalas. Come, Come on in. When people gave him Christmas presents, it would be coats and boots and shoes, and he'd have to run right over to show us what he got for because I'd have to say, wait a minute, Andy, I have to get a picture of this. I have to get a picture. And that's how we would preserve this, or else he would never post it. But then it's kind of like he's getting this portrait of a, a reclusive yeah, exhibitionist. That's you know? right, that's right. Of his new outfit. You're yeah. right. Incredible. Look what we have on sweaters. <laughs> yeah. He looks like the King of Denmark dropping <laughs> he does, in. He does. Christmas 2008 would be Andy's last with the Sipalas. He died just a few weeks later, at the ripe old age of 91. Helen Sipala sent her condolences to his widow, Betsy. Dear Betsy and family, we are thinking of you during this very difficult time. We send our love, thoughts, prayers. George and I have lost a dear and loyal friend in Andy. 20 years ago, he entered our lives and never left. So many memories, so much joy, and a real honor to know him. We will miss him dearly, especially at Christmas. This past Christmas, he stopped in during the morning and had his last cup of tea with us. It was touching. Love, Helen. Mm -hmm. So, then he was gone.
the morning after Wyeth's death, Betsy turned to the family that had made her husband famous all those years earlier. Out of the blue, John Olson, nephew of Andrew's muse, Christina, received a call inquiring about the family graveyard. The morning he died, Betsy called me. And she says, I want you to know that Andy's passed away, and you're the first to know it. Were you surprised that he wanted to be buried alongside Christina in the family plot? Yes, I was. But she said, well, she said, she made us famous, so we feel that we ought to buried there. So I, I went ahead with it. The grave digger came down to the house, knocked on the door, and he said, uh, where are you putting Andy? And I, I said, what do you mean, where am I putting Andy? And he said, well, I guess you're the one that's got to pick out his grave. So I had to go up to the cemetery and, and find a spot where he, oh. where to bury him. Was that a difficult thing to choose? Well, I walked around and I said, what do you do with a famous man? Yes. What? And I mean, I'm not a famous person by no means. I, I'm just a common everyday person around here. And so I picked out the spot where he's buried. Yeah. OK, so now it's ready. Bait it up. Wow. Let me, Let me just watch it. Oh, wow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Right. Here we go. Okay. God bless her and all the go down. And here we have Anna Christina's grave That's and her brother Christina. El and yeah. her brother Alvaro. Yeah. And Christina's parents. It's a modest little cemetery, isn't it? It is. It's, it's, it's just a, a few families. Yeah. And here we have um, Andrew Wyatt's grave. Yeah, that's Andrew's. This is the newest grave in the cemetery. Nice, simple stuff. Yeah, very simple, just the name and date. Yeah, no other information. Mm. Yeah. That's the most recent That's grave, the most then, recent grave. There's almost nothing here which I like. I think I'm more attracted as I get old, older by nothing. Vacancy. Light on the side of a wall or the light on these snow drifts and our shadows across them. Uh, it makes me go back more into my soul, I guess. But you have to save it for the right moment. Uh, it's like building up uh, your urge for sex. If you let it peter out all the time, it's no good. But if you build it up for the right moment, it's terrific. And I find that's true with painting. I mean, you could be going along, I can be going along and think, God, this is, it's, oh, this is all vacant. And then I'll see a piece of barbed wire against the snow, rusted barbed wire with maybe a piece of, of, uh, of a horse's uh, mane caught in it. And that rusty barbed wire and that horse's mane, hair, it can just go to you and get you going. After a life dedicated to art, it seems right that Andrew Wyeth's final resting place is almost at the spot where he painted Christina in front of her family home. It seemed a gesture typical of the man that even in death he wanted to be with the people whose ordinary lives and hard struggles he depicted for so long. The more I've learned about Andrew Wyeth, the more intriguing I find him. A brilliant technician and a man of mischief, a playful prankster, disciplined enough to paint on almost every single day of his working life. An artist who created a unique world, Wyeth's world, by capturing time and time again the universal in his own backyard. Coming up on BBC Two, a tray of Fry's Christmas delight with a seasonal special QI next. Then for 2013, the best images came from the camera in your pocket. Smartphones capture moments in time at 10.30.